Janet? Yeah. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Well, I appreciate you all coming out today on this nice sunshiny day in Juneau. Typical fall weather. When I uh, look at uh, the history of our country, we look at some very notable people uh, to, who have done good things for us, but we don't have very much written about our own people. And so uh, part of my uh, efforts are to uh, complement the history with uh, some of the uh, things that our earlier uh, leaders did uh, as we went through our contact with the United States. The, the policies of the United States towards Native Americans has changed uh, sometimes dramatically over uh, this period of time that I'm going to be covering in my presentation. When you look at history, you often think about the uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, even Martin Luther King, as people that did notable things for our country uh, during the early stages of our uh, development. And then uh, those that addressed uh, uh, racism, uh, you know, got a lot of publicity but very little about uh, the, the racism issues that we went through. Or the heroes, like uh, you might know Simone Biles uh, being a gymnast that uh, has been in the news a lot, uh, one of the uh, persons that have the most uh, uh, gold medals throughout her career. Uh, but you, we also have some of those that I'm talk very briefly about in, in my presentation. When I talk about decades, I try to break down uh, the, uh, the various uh, chapters into uh, decades. Now, this very first one is two decades. And uh, during uh, this period of time in the relationship that our people had uh, with the federal government, uh, we had a lot of challenges. Uh, we had uh, really a very uh, important uh, process of our people who were uh, Clinket and Haidas and Simpson speakers 
uh, learning not only the language of the non-natives, but also the written laws so that they could make a difference. Uh, during that uh, time, uh, our, our relationship with the United States, uh, we were de de denied citizenship. And without citizenship, we could not vote or hold public office. Uh, we could not own private lands. And uh, they passed laws that prohibited our children from going to public schools. And then there was a process of assuming our uh, homeland under uh, United States law. There's a couple examples of the suppression of our rights. The Nelson Act of uh, uh, 1905 prohibited our children from attending public schools. They had to attend BIA schools that were uh, per predominant at the time. And then Chapter 24 uh, uh, was uh, a law that uh, was passed that would allow our people to be citizens so long as they gave up their cultural heritage and their native languages. And our people did not really want to buy into that kind of a system. Now, talking about taking of our native lands, you know, the formation of the uh, Tongass National Forest uh, was very important in uh, saying, well, these are no longer Clinkett lands or Haida lands. These are federal lands under the Forest Act under the Department of uh, Agriculture. And, uh, and also uh, the formation or creating Alaska as a territory of the United States was also a very important happening during that time relative to land. Now, federal law uh, was, uh, was pretty negative towards us except for uh, one little bright shining spot, and that was the act of, of uh, the Bi-Indian Act, I must say, of 1910 that gave uh, the Native Americans an opportunity to contract with the federal government uh, for the programs and, and uh, things that benefited our Native. This, during this time also, the uh, Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood was formed, and they become very imp became very important in the progression of our people going from a uh, total Native lifestyle uh, into the uh, United States uh, way of doing business. Next, in chapter two, we talk about the basic rights of our, the assumption of basic rights of our people from 1920 to 1940. Here's when the, uh, the Alaska Native Brotherhood began to show its effectiveness. Uh, the Citizen Act, Citizenship Act of 1924 was so very important to us and uh, uh, not only gave us citizen, uh, citizen rate, but gave us right to own property, to vote. And then William Paul was elected the year after uh, as a uh, representative in the territorial legislation. When we talk about land, uh, land rights fight, uh, uh, obviously our people were concerned way back uh, prior to 1912 uh, but really did not uh, come to a point of actually pushing for the assumption of our land or getting fair compensation for our land until 1929 at a meeting in Haines of the AMB and ANS. They passed a resolution to uh, uh, go forward and sue the federal government for our land. And uh, this led to a situation where uh, they could not uh, recognized the Alaska Native Brotherhood or Sisterhood as a plaintiff. And so the AMB and ANS went to Congress and had, the past, uh, had passed the Jurisdiction Act of 1935, which recognized the Clinton Haida people as one singular tribe for the purpose of continuing with the suit in behalf of our people for our land. Another thing that happened during that period of time was the Amendment to the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. It was amended in 1936 uh, to create, uh, to recognize tribes in Alaska. So if you come from a community like Ketchikan or Huna or Wrangell, all those places have IRA councils that are federally recognized tribe. And that was the result of the AMB 
and their efforts to amend that law. Our people had always been very good at fishing. And so when the exploitation of fisheries in our region became very obvious, our people uh, got involved in fishing. And it was important for the Indian Organization Act because it provided funding for many of our fishermen to go out and buy their own boats uh, and to uh, go forward uh, in a competitive manner uh, in the fishing industry. And one of the highlights of uh, uh, Native involvement was the building of a Native cannery in Cloaca in 1923 built by Charlie Dimmer. Here are some of the leaders of the time. I, you might wonder why I have Judson Brown there. He was the secretary of the a and in 1929 when the uh, act, of, I mean the resolution was passed to sue the federal government. One of the most troublesome uh, eras in uh, Native American history was the termination era. Uh, that is from 1940s to 1960. In that time, Congress really was held bent to uh, do away with uh, federal relationships with tribes. Not only did they stop uh, recognizing tribes, but they tried to extinguish some of the tribes that were already in place. And assim assimilation was the name of the game uh, during this period of time. This led then to the lower 48 tribes to pull together and formulate the National Congress of American Indians that happened in 1944. What happened during that time is uh, our suit that was filed in, in 1929 and, and uh, uh, recognized in 1935 was basically stalled in Congress and went nowhere uh, during that period of time. Oh, I forgot to mention that also during that period of time, our people didn't give up. What they did is they, I guess you can call it tax, but they assessed each person in each community, $2 for each child and $5 for each adult. And that's what they used to go out and continue the lobbying of Congress on behalf of uh, our people for our land. Now getting back to the fishing industry, um, many of the large fishing companies, you know, whether it was Louis McNeil or Mack and Packing Company, uh, they all owned fish traps that uh, caught fish by the millions. Not only did it deplete the fishery, but it created a system whereby there was no value of the fish for the fishermen, uh, that many of our people participated as fishermen. So that really was very uh, negative to our people. And our people continued to work with other non-native fishermen uh, to get rid of fish traps. But they went nowhere because the large fish packing companies pretty much had Congress members in their pocket. So much similar to what's happening now with the oil company, it's a guess. But uh, that was the reality. And so our people joined some of the non-native fisheries people in fighting for statehood so that we can manage our own fishing. And here's some of the people that was uh, very actively involved uh, in leading the battle during that period of time. And pretty much out of sight because uh, they were pretty much known in the, uh, the native community through A and B and A and S, but really did not get any uh, visible uh, publicity uh, during that period of time. Next comes the advocacy area, uh, uh, 1960 and 1970 to 1970. Uh, during this time, the Alaska Federation of Natives became very active and doing some good things and working with Congress. Uh, and uh, they are not only uh, very uh, useful in the land fight, but also in other areas that uh, we uh, were challenged by the non-native community and particularly the state of Alaska. One of the uh, things that uh, happened uh, during this time was uh, Congress did finally settle the Clinkett-Hyda lawsuit. Now, uh, 
when they settled it for seven and a half million dollars, that uh, was a result of a uh, uh, in inching down through negotiations, if you may, amongst themselves, Democrats and Republicans, because the thing that, I mean, the amount that was shared with our people is we're going to get 50 plus million for Southeast Alaska. And when it all settled out, it ended up being uh, seven and a half million dollars. Now, uh, you have to wonder, is Southeast Alaska worth seven and a half million dollars? I think it's worth a heck of a lot more than that. Uh, but this particular settlement, even though uh, the lawyers advised our people that it violated the constitution of fair uh, compensation for land taking, uh, we still accepted it so that we could join forces with the AFM, uh, the Alaska Federation of Natives, for a broader land, land suit uh, to cover the whole state of Alaska and to try to get not only compensation in dollars, but also some of our land back. Here are some of the uh, people that were very active during that period of time. Um, some of you may know Marlene Johnson. Uh, she was very active in Clinton Haida for many years on the executive committee uh, before Sea Alaska came about and was very active uh, during the period of time on making the transition along with Byron Malott and then later came uh, Cheney Lees, who's a Haida originally from uh, Metlakatla. Self-determination era, uh, this is uh, an era that I uh, relate to quite a bit. I like, uh, I like what happened during that period of time. Uh, one of the most important resolutions that passed in Congress uh, to begin this era was uh, Resolution 26, which totally reversed the uh, policies of the United States from one of termination and assimilation to more of self-determination uh, which uh, uh, turned some of the uh, policies over to the tribes to work with the federal government to improve so that they can be more self-determined and determine their own future. This is a very important resolution that uh, uh, we still uh, are benefiting from today. The Clinton Haida uh, Central Council negotiated what's called the Bay Indian Contract in 1971. And this was the very first uh, contract in Alaska that uh, where the natives went out and negotiated with the federal government to manage their own contracts. And so this was kind of trailblazing. And what it amounted to, the we had what was called the Southeast Agency of the BIA for Southeast Alaska. And uh, uh, Clinton Haida, under leadership of John Borbich, uh, went and they negotiated a contract to manage all the program that the BIA had for our region. Uh, during that period of time also, we formulated the Clinton Hyde Regional Housing Authority and the Clinton Hyde Regional Electrical Authority. In 1972, the Indian Education Act was passed. And uh, some of you may or may not know Dr. William Demert Jr. Uh, he was going to Harvard during the time prior to that and was able to work with uh, 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 Senator Kennedy uh, from Massachusetts to uh, talk about how are we going to have Indian education into the school systems. And so he worked with uh, them and they reached out and worked with other Native American tribes and educators from across the country and came up with the Indian Education Act that was passed in 1972. This was a very important act for uh, bridging the gap between uh, our culture and getting our cultures into the school system. And uh, when I uh, finished uh, my schooling, I went uh, to work under that act uh, in Sitka uh, with the Indian Education Program there uh, under Isabella Brady. Also during that period of time in 1975 was the passage of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. This, not, this act not only provided the same things that the Bay Indian Act did, it required the federal government to enter into a contract with any tribe or tribal organization that wanted to get involved in contracting for those services that were designed to benefit our people. And that act uh, really uh, gave lifeblood, if you may, 
to the small tribes in Alaska, the, uh, the, the basic uh, Indian I IRA tribes, rather, at the basic uh, community level. And that really was useful in strengthening uh, tribal, tribal governance at the local level. Here are some of the people that uh, you recognize that were involved. Uh, now, Richard Peterson is the president of Clinton Haida Central Council, but during that period of time, he was actually in, in Kassan running a uh, program there under a contract with the BIA and was very much involved in uh, negotiating some of the uh, programs for his community during that time. In healthcare, you see Ethel Lund there. Uh, she was one of the trailblazers, if you may, uh, her and her staff getting involved in uh, contracting for health care. Uh, that was a little bit more difficult than contracting with some of the human service programs that we at Lincoln Hyder did or people did at the local level. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, for our people to get involved in managing health care. And she teamed up with Niall Caesar we you see down there in the lower uh, right-hand corner. And they did some great things in paving the way for people get, or Native people getting involved in contracting for health care services. Ivan Gamel down there in the bottom was uh, from Angoon, and he really was quite involved in debating uh, a regional concept versus a uh, village concept because he felt very strongly that people at the local level probably needed those services more at the local level than they did at the regional level. Corporations. You know, when I talk about uh, regional compensation for land, uh, I do it uh, kind of with tongue in cheek because uh, uh, most of the people who do assessments nowadays would say the compensation was not fair, nor was it uh, adequate for the amount of things that happened. Now, it took many decades for us to get the very first settlement. I talked a little bit about the uh, $7 million that we got. But keep in mind that the process began in 1929. It wasn't until 1968 that we got any movement on that lawsuit and lobbying all those years in uh, non-native government uh, by native people that uh, English was a second language. So it really took a long time to come about. When ANCSA was passed, it was pretty celebrated that uh, you know, the amount of money was uh, you know, much better than our settlement. And then getting part of our land back, that was much more important than the, uh, this dollar amount. One of the things that people don't realize is that Prior to the passage of the Claim Settlement Act or Public Law 93638, the self determined Act, many of our people were subsistence type people, commercial fishermen or worked in canneries and that type thing. And so when the act was passed and we were forced to formulate corporations under state law, uh, you know, it became a heyday for attorneys to come in, you know, make big bucks off of our settlement. Um, that's my own opinion. I'm not saying that to criticize anybody, but that was a reality in my eyes that we had uh, uh, really uh, people that uh, were intelligent and learned uh, our, the ways of the non-natives, but they still were providing for the families in a subsistence lifestyle. Next thing you know, they're in a boardroom and having to make some major decisions under laws that were somewhat unfamiliar to them. And uh, it was really uh, later that uh, people start saying, well, gee whiz, why did we have a settlement whereby you had to form a corporation under state law? Why not uh, have the dollars go to the tribes and formulate the corporations under federal law? Because Section 17 of the Indian Organization Act provides an opportunity for uh, people to do business under federal law instead of state law. But that's not a point of contention at this point in time. Some of the corporations are doing very well and some are struggling, but that was the same uh, in almost any circumstance. Here we have some of the leadership during that period of time. Uh, right up front, of course, is Dr. Sobolev. 
Um, you might not recognize uh, uh, some of these folks. Uh, Robert Sanderson, the picture I have him is when he was very young, uh, just now getting involved. Uh, but you do recognize uh, probably Byron a lot. That picture in the middle is uh, pretty important, I think, because this was the signing ceremony of when Sea Alaska was being incorporated. I, I, under chapter seven of the program, I, I clumped a lot of things that we did into one chapter. And uh, throughout that time, uh, you know, we had people that belonged to lots of different organizations uh, and, uh, and still participated in being leadership, uh, in, in leadership positions in singular organizations. One of the things that um, I think it's important to state again is the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood, uh, prior to the passage of the Clinton Haida Act and Sea Alaska, or the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, was the most powerful nonprofit organization, not only in the region, but in the state. Uh, they uh, had people coming in uh, on a volunteer basis from all our communities. They raised their own money to travel in on sane boats or uh, uh, things like that because there was no ferries during that time and traveling by air was very expensive. So they came in during that time. I already talked through about some of the prohibitions in our relationship with the federal government, but uh, all that was turned around with the efforts of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood. And even now, some of our leadership uh, relies on their uh, relationship with the AMB uh, so that they can participate in the politics of our region. Here we have some of the older leaders and, and some of the newer. Uh, I don't know if you recognize the person down on the lower left, uh, Peter Simpson. He was not Tlingit or Haida, uh, but he was one of the only non clinton Haida people that became inducted into the President Emeritus Hall of Fame because he was the brainchild, if you may, of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and later the Alaska Native Sisterhood and was relied a lot upon for his early leadership to uh, bring about the effectiveness of that organization. Cultural preservation, uh, one of the good things about uh, the um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, I guess. Uh, assimilation was really a challenge to uh, people prior to my generation. Um, we had, uh, like I talked about the laws, the uh, Sessions laws in 1915, uh, they wanted to assimilate. When you went to any school, whether it was uh, public school or uh, federal schools, assimilation was pushed, pushed, and pushed, as well as done by the religious people. Turning that around uh, came about uh, more profoundly when the ANCSA was passed and money was set aside uh, at, the, uh, at, at the pushing of some of our elders uh, in almost all the regions of Alaska to have uh, uh, foundations set up, nonprofit foundations of the ANCSA corporations in the regions. And uh, that was really a very important uh, thing to come about. Down here we had the Sealaska Heritage Foundation, which uh, was later moved into being the institute and provided a lot of uh, scholarships early on in the organization. And then when Dr. Rosita World came about, she transformed that into be more and more cultural and uh, not only using our funding from Sealaska, but going out and uh, lobbying and uh, getting uh, foundation money and uh, grant money uh, to bring around things like this building and the building across the street. And uh, that served as a catalyst for that happening in many of our villages. I know that uh, when you have the celebration in every, uh, uh, every even year, you see a lot of dance groups there that uh, not only learn the songs by coming to the celebration, but they bring them back home and then they add to their knowledge about the heritage songs uh, as they go forward. And uh, here again, we did do now have some programs that are actually working 
in the school systems uh, teach our people about our heritage and culture. And here are some of the people, uh, you may or may not recognize some people, but uh, one of the people I worked with at, uh, in Ketchikan was uh, Irma Lawrence. And she was a tireless advocate for the Haida language. She would spend hours meeting with people and uh, she had the personality whereby people were willing to talk with her. And this was before computers and she had a little tape recorder that she recorded a lot of the old time stories and began work, uh, the early work on the Haida Dictionary. Uh, and you might recognize the person up in the right hand corner, uh, Rosita Whirl, who really, uh, I think, uh, was a leader in many of these uh, programs down uh, through the last couple decades. Down on the lower left hand side, or right hand side, I guess, uh, you see Clarence Jackson. Uh, if you don't recognize where this picture is taken, it is taken behind the uh, podium of the United States president because he did the prayer prior to uh, President Obama coming out and speaking to uh, Native Americans uh, during one of the conferences that he had with it. And they reached out and picked Clarence. He didn't tell us any good stories at that time, though. <laughs> Tribal government leadership was important uh, during this era. Uh, our people had to not only uh, go in and learn the laws to contract the programs, but they had to work with the people at the local level and create an understanding of how these programs worked and, uh, and negotiate with uh, agencies that pretty much were uh, uh, hell-bent against uh, Indians running their own programs. And here are some of the people, and I, uh, people wonder why, uh, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, Richard Stokes here uh, from Wrangell. Uh, he was one of those that uh, utilized the Native organizations, brought them together, and formulated what they called the Stikine Native Organization, which was Clinton Haida, uh, community Council, the uh, A&B, and then the IRA Council, and use that organization to go out and get grant monies and, and create some administrative uh, capabilities within the community. Leadership and education, I already talked a little bit about it, but uh, we had a lot of our people going out and getting higher education degrees during this period of time, coming back with uh, master's and doctorate degrees and our people excelled in sports. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't recognize that our, our, what am I trying to say, the uh, gold medal tournament really got a lot of attention during that period of time. It was uh, not a thing whereby uh, it took a federal program to come by and get us interested in education. Our native people always believed strongly in educating the next generation, whether it was through the clan system, you educate your new clan leader, or whether it was uh, uh, an uncle teaching the uh, boys in the family how to go out and make a living and how to participate in the ceremonies of their clan. So throughout the ages, our people uh, went about and, uh, and kept pace with education and uh, brought about uh, an atmosphere where our people uh, really, um, you know, was able to move in and embrace education when the in-education programs came along. Here are a few of the people that uh, were involved there. You might uh, not, not recognize uh, Joe Coquelin, but he was one of those people who was uh, involved in school administration long before it was popular. Uh, not only did he do it in Alaska, but it was done in, uh, down in Arizona for a number of years, uh, working as a school administrator down there. Down in the lower right-hand corner, you see uh, Herb Diedrichson on the cover of Times Magazine because of his baseball, uh, basketball skills. He was one of the uh, persons that was so skilled that he was compared to many of the uh, athletes down in lower 48 for his uh, skills in sportsmanship. Political advocacy, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I already talked about 
uh, William Paul being elected territorial legislation. But it continued through time until where we had Byron Malott uh, elected to become the lieutenant governor for the state of Alaska. And down in the lower two uh, uh, paid, I mean two boxes below, we talk about those that were in the territorial legislation. And on the bottom, we talk about those who were involved in the state legislation. And this is a continuation uh, of that advocacy. And down in the lower part, you know, our people participated over time with the National Congress of American Indians, serving on boards, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, in a more recent times, Jackie Peta was hired as the executive director, and she served over 16 years, which is about five times longer than any other Native American served in that capacity in the life of that organization. I think the longest person to serve there was four years consecutively. And then Albert Kukesh, of course, uh, was the chairman of the Alaska Federation of Natives for, I don't remember how many years that was, but it was more than a decade. And he always said that uh, so often they would select him because he knew how to run a meeting. He was very skilled in Robert's Rules of Order, and so they would re-elect him uh, all until the years he decided to kind of step aside. Here are some of the people that were involved throughout that time. And you may not uh, recognize Andrew Hope, but he served at Clinton High President from the early 1940s until 1968 when the, when the settlement of our lawsuit came about. Uh, and he did it all on a volunteer basis. He didn't get paid. Uh, he, he would just go to the meetings and follow up on the lawsuit and, and communicate with the uh, people through the A&B. Subsistence has always been so very important. And, uh, you know, the uh, process of eradicating the resources on our homeland really was troublesome to our people uh, way, even way back when. And um, fighting for subsistence when it should be automatic uh, for people to assume that you go out and you get some off the land, uh, that's a priority. Not with the state of Alaska. Throughout the decades since 1982, we've been battling with the state of Alaska over very simple policies to allow our people to uh, participate in a subsistence way of life without obstruction. And during that time, uh, we have some of the people who were really involved. They might wonder, why do I have Rosita there? She wasn't out plunging or gathering stuff. She wrote more meaningful resolutions at AFN than anybody that I know of. And I served on there several years. And sometimes we would uh, debate some of those. And she didn't always agree with me. But she was very persistent on making sure subsistence was on the priority list of the Alaska Federation of Natives. I'm going to close talking about aboriginal rights or the existence of our people as aboriginal to these lands. Um, you can see that uh, what aboriginal means, that uh, means that you're of the land. And these were our homelands, Clinton Haida territory. Uh, one of the common myths is that uh, we must have come here from Europe, or I mean Asia, across a land bridge. And uh, that uh, it was really uh, much evident because there was no evidence of our people being here uh, uh, after, until after 19, until after uh, uh, 10,000 years ago. But keep in mind that our people were driven off the land uh, by the Ice Age uh, just prior to 10,000 years ago. And we have myths and legends about that. But here's, here's the uh, myth that I talk about. The migration must have happened uh, this way. And some of the arguments I have against that, <coughs> of course, was the issue of the Ice Age. But the finding of more uh, old artifacts in Canada down the West Coast, and uh, probably as important is uh, when people migrate, they take their language with them. 
and we don't have uh, many of the languages over here uh, that, uh, that are existent over in Russia or in Asia. And, and, and finally, there's really no logical reason in my mind why we would have to migrate from somewhere else. You know, the bears didn't have to migrate, the, the uh, buffalo never migrated from over there. Um, and, and not only that, if we migrated, what about those people all the way down the tip of South America? Did they migrate all the way from Russia and uh, just kind of make their way through the uh, Panama Canal area? Uh, in my mind, I don't think so. Anyway, here's a picture of the linguistics in North America, just North America, not South America. We have some 28 different dialects of language in North America. And uh, so just uh, taking this slide alone and comparing it to what you have in Asia, we don't have that many uh, that would com compare with those uh, dialects uh, over there, over here. You know, there's no no real correlation in my mind. One final uh, thing that uh, came about is that in 2021, uh, there were human footprints found in the White Sands National Park in New Mexico that were believed to be 21 to 23,000 years old. That is when there were still dinosaurs around. Uh, that we still had uh, those kinds of creatures amongst us. Uh, and uh, so our people, not our people, but the people that were in the White Sands area were there at that same period of time in, our, in the history of the world. Anyway, the two separate studies verified the age of those uh, things. So in my mind, we are Aboriginal to our land, our homeland, Southeast Alaska. Finally, happy Walter Sobolev Day, everybody. Um, it's good to be in this building, particularly in this room, you know, the building named after Dr. Walter Sobolev, because he was so important, uh, not just in our culture, he was a religious leader who used to uh, have, uh, 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 re not uh, religious, but uh, with uh, religious ceremonies on the radio and they broadcast throughout South Alaska, Southeast Alaska when he was the uh, pastor at the uh, church, uh, Presbyterian Church, Northern Lights Presbyterian Church. Finally, my name is Ed Thomas and I approve this message. <laughs> I don't know if I have time for questions, but if you have questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. You can do the recognizing who's got the question. We have a microphone for those in the room. Thank you, for your words. I learned a lot uh, as you were going, and uh, I noticed you weren't reading off the slides, so I'd really pay attention to what you were saying and read it at the same time. It was, uh, it was great, lots of information. I was wondering about uh, Peter Simpson, I think his name was, that had the original idea that helped stir uh, ENB and ANS. Um, was that his name? Peter yeah, Simpson. Peter Simpson. Yeah, we, uh, I was wondering if you could go more into uh, who, who that was, or you, you mentioned that he wasn't Southeast Alaska Native, but I was wondering if he was Native American of any other tribe. Well, uh, just a little bit of history. The uh, Simpson people were moved from Old, old uh, Metlakatla to uh, Metlakatla, Alaska, about, uh, I don't know how many years before, but uh, Peter Simpson was the Simpson from there and went to the Sitka training school in Sitka. And a group of them went to a workshop put on by another nonprofit organization. And they saw how this non-native group organized themselves. They had to uh, buy laws and conducted themselves with rules of order and all that stuff. So he brought it back and uh, he and, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, there were three of them that were really actively involved in saying, well, let's reach out. And so they took other people from the Sitka Training School and formulated the first organized group of 12 to start the A and B. But that's about all I know about Peter Simpson. He continued uh, involvement down in Ketchikan after 
A and B was formulated to try to get some of the land back that they lost uh, down there. Across where the airport was, that was land that uh, the, the clan that he was from had settled in the, in the creek right there south of the Ketchikan Airport. That used to be their land. So he fought for that after his uh, days in Sitka. That's all I know about him. I wasn't there. <laughs> There's a couple of questions online. Uh, I would like to know if the University of Alaska teaches this in their core classes, um, as well as, um, perhaps I missed it, but he keeps referring to chapters. Do you have a book? Do I have what? A book? <clears throat> I think. Uh, Rosita probably can answer this question better than I can about what's happening with our relationship with the university. But, um, you know, over the years, uh, Juno has been uh, a catalyst for getting better relations with the university, as far as I know. There, I know up in Fairbanks, uh, where Dr. Sobolev worked also, when I was up there, uh, they had a native education program up there, or what they called rural education that they tried to bridge the gap. But here on the language, I'm not totally sure about what's going on there. Do you know, Rosita? Um, right now, I have to say, at the University of Alaska Southeast, it's uh, SHI that puts in uh, probably over a million dollars uh, into the university at, in Juneau. We fund the, lang uh, the language programs. We fund the art programs. And we also fund the teacher training program. Uh, I will say that uh, Dr. Lance Twitchell has been doing a great job of trying to integrate uh, native language, native studies into the University of Alaska. And it's kind of right now, I'd say he, he is the man, you know, that's doing that. Uh, we've, other, we've also had other native professors there that have uh, integrated uh, native history uh, into, into their courses. But I think right now it's being formalized under uh, Dr. Thank you. Was there another one? It's really someone in the audience. <laughs> Yeah, I'm working on uh, the publication of the book, and it's in its final stages. Uh, we have uh, some critical editing that needed to take place because uh, there's concern about, you know, when uh, doing the research, I'm not, I'm not a researcher uh, as part of my education. So when I copy things out of the books and out of the web page, that's considered plagiarism. So we got to make sure that as we go forward that proper credit is given to those uh, people who originally wrote, you know, the profiles or uh, history and the stories about some of these folks. So that's what the final product is trying to work out. But it will be publication and then hopefully we'll be able to get it in the, uh, uh, the Sea Alaska Heritage website, the Box of Knowledge, hopefully, so people can look at it. But we're also doing a website at Clinton Ida Central Council, which will uh, allow this program to go in the future so we can recognize some of the people who are doing good things now. And that will be decided by a committee, not just myself. Thank you. I really appreciated how this um, talk was organized with some of the big moves over time and then this cast of characters um, that you presented. And I'm curious about, kind of going back toward the beginning, the Clinkett Haida Council yeah. works together. I, so I'd be really curious to hear a little bit about how Clinkett people and Haida people, who are the leaders that worked on that initial coalition building? How they did what? How they got together? Yeah, yeah. how they got together. Yeah. It was primarily because they were both uh, tribal representatives in the Alaska Native Brotherhood. And when it came about to sue the federal government, uh, they, 
uh, occupied Southeast Alaska. And that's what the original lawsuit was about, was the taking of Southeast Alaska. And so instead of saying, well, we're gonna have a Clinkett lawsuit and a Haida lawsuit for the same land, they put it into Clinkett and Haida and formulated it as a tribe, recognized as a tribe, which is very unique, quite by the way. There's some of that happened in the lower 48, but not very much. And, and when I was growing up, though, you would find a situation where you would not have a clinket sleep in a hide bed question because um, one of the things that you may have picked up on when you look at some of these folks that are highlighted here is they did not wait for a federal program or state program or anything. They went out and did things uh, to protect the rights of our people. And then the education system where they reach down. So it's our responsibility in this generation to reach down and educate the next generation, so we're, it's not repeated whereby our pe people are pushed down to a lower level that they come forward with the amount of pride and understanding that is necessary to have a culture move forward. A culture cannot move forward uh, just uh, on book. It can't be in a principle. You have to have some leadership and pride in order for it to move forward. And you gotta understand uh, your people as well as the people that are opposed to your culture. I would also like to acknowledge your leadership as um, working at KIC and Clinton and Haida for many years. I'm not sure how many years you worked at Clinton and Haida as the president there. Well, I was at uh, KIC for nine years, and I was president of Clinkett Haida for 27 years. And when I was down at KIC, I was the uh, first president of the reorganization. Then I stepped down and became the executive director for about five years. But then that was in an era where we were writing you know, under public law 9638 grants and that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, when I was leaving Ketchikan, I thought, uh, gee whiz, did I do a good enough job in, in uh, having a plan for people to move forward? Our people are able to get caught up in things and learn what their responsibilities are. And I think they even did some better things after I was gone, once I got out of the way. Any more questions? We've got four minutes. I... Well, uh, thank you for your presentation. And I just been kind of looking at some of the questions that were asked and looking at your leadership. What would you say that is your, something that you've done um, that is most meaningful um, to you, um, that is um, carried forth for future generations? That's a very challenging question because uh, politically and uh, managing an organization has a lot of highlights, uh, but reaching down and learning part of my own, own culture from some of the elders probably was most meaningful 
for the long term as a person. So I think you've got to balance. Uh, if you do good things politically and management and whatever, and you learn from those things, to keep a vision on where you came from as a person. Because without the two of them, you end up uh, kind of uh, doing things that are against the grain of what your culture is all about or against your administrative responsibilities, focusing too much the other way. So I think that uh, reaching down and working with some of the elders uh, was really the highlight. You know, I always bring up Mary Jones in Ketchikan. When I first went to work at the uh, Indian Education Program, I didn't know a lot about the history of the a and or the local politics in Ketchikan, but she was from there and she guided me along and uh, without her help, I probably would not have learned as much as I did um, about the realities of managing these kinds of programs in a community where people are in need and, uh, and sometimes confrontational, you know, confronting each other over some of the decisions that were made by the leadership. And you're going to find a lot of that now if you look at the national politics of the separation of Democrats and Republicans. You look at uh, corporations, the animosities that we have for leadership. Uh, to get more educated is most important, and participation is very important. Without uh, that, it, you're leaving your destiny to somebody else. And get involved in local non-profit, non-native politics as well, whether it's school board, whether it's uh, community, uh, city council, or state uh, representation. It's, it's good to do that. We need more people. So I start all over. <laughs> With that, I want to thank you once again for coming out on this very important day, Dr. Walt Soboleff Day. And, uh, what, uh, what, you know, working through the weather is not easy, uh, particularly trying to find a place to park or in the snow and the rain. Kind of hard around here. So. Thanks for the extra effort. Come to see how I